Thank you for sitting in the front row. I'm friendly. If you want to move forward, feel free to do so. So, I gave you moving forward. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> this was not rehearsed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I too. Yeah, no one. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm fighting the temptation to start with a joke. 
Should I, should I give in? I think I should give in. Um, okay, before I, uh, before I get to the joke, um, I, I want to say a little bit about, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about my last 30 years. Um, no, just kidding, don't worry. Um, but I do want to say a little bit more about what got me here because I'm going to say some things that are somewhere between audacious and quixotic and um, maybe even slightly bombastic. Only a few times. Most of it's going to be very solid. Um, but I want but I want you to know that it comes from 30 years of doing deals and sitting on boards and this and that. So just to give you a little a little bit of that, um, bef uh, before Investor Circle, I should give you a little bit more on Investor Circle. Actually, I'll work backwards. Investor Circle uh, has been around for 16 years. Um, we have 225 members at the moment, uh, primarily high net worth individuals, but several dozens um, non-traditional, relatively small scale social purpose venture funds of different kinds, a few foundations, a few family offices. And uh, Investor Circle members have invested over $130 million into 200 early stage, mostly individual startup companies, but occasionally other small funds of various kinds that are doing sustainable investing. So it's everything from organics to renewable energy, um, community development, healthcare, broad, broad range. Um, and um, that's the most immediate experience that led me to slow money because um, uh, it's a beautiful thing that we're doing at Best Circle, but it's also relatively inefficient and diffuse. You've got angels coming together looking at a bunch of individual transactions, and those of you who know much about venture capital know that 130 million into 200 deals over 16 years is very small um, by current standards. So one of the things that is very fun about all of this is that you say, what's small, what's slow, what's local, what do all these words mean? But we'll talk some more about that. Um, before doing that, I was treasurer of, of a New York-based foundation called the Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, which is, uh, which was for many years one of the really progressive, still is very progressive, but it was one of the very early uh, grant makers in sustainable agriculture. Um, uh, it's, I'm not sure what the assets are now. In the 90s, it was in around $60 million. Uh, and we did something which was considered very radical. But how many people here know about foundation investment policy? I'm just curious. All right. So to those of you who don't, it may seem astonishing that it is a radical thing for a foundation to invest its assets in ways which are consistent with its mission as a foundation. That is, I mean, that is considered radical. It is a roaring, this has been going on for 20 years, this discussion, to try to get a few percent of foundation assets to not be invested in, quote, the market, but to actually target the things that are consistent with the philanthropic purpose of the foundation. This is one of many examples of the, let's say, um, the broken nature of industrial capitalism. It, it, it separates out social purpose from profit. Um, uh, so anyway, I'll, without getting more into the ideas, I'll come back to all that when I'm going through the, the story. But I, so that was uh, most of the 90s, I was treasurer of a foundation that was trying to use its assets in a way which, which promoted its mission. Um, in the course of doing that, we invested in Stonyfield Yogurt at a time when it was at about 30 million in sales. Now it's at about 400 million in sales. Um, million questions there about is that good bad or you know how, is it too big now and it's part of group down on a whole series of questions all of which relate back to many of the questions we're trying to do we're trying to solve for in slow money I mean giving the punchline you know how do we invest in things that we actually care about and keep them small independent and diverse and local I mean that's really where we're going with all of this but we'll, we'll come back to that and then before that in the um, I can remember back that far um, in the 80s, I was a venture capitalist with, with a, a family venture fund, a $10 million venture fund, tiny by today's standards. But I'm, so I'm sorry I belabored that, but I, it's important to know that I didn't just come up with this last month in response to what happened on Wall Street. Um, now, so, uh, oh, the joke. So, um, now th this joke has been around for a couple of decades. That's the crazy thing, but it actually takes on, you know, new meaning. Um, so the story goes that a woman is waiting outside of the operating room and after many hours, a surgeon comes out, and sweaty, and takes his mask off, and she's looking at him. He says, I've got bad news, good news, and bad news for you. He says, oh, my God, what's the first bad news? He said, the bad news is your, your husband's brain tumor is, in fact, completely inoperable. I can't go in there. It's, I can't touch it. So she has, breaks down for a while, collects herself. So what do you say? You had some good news. What could possibly be good news out there? Well, the good news is it's, it's amazing. But this week in this medical center, we are the first to perfect a brain transplant operation, first in the world, and we have three donors available. He said, "My God, that's beyond good news. It's phenomenal. It's, it's great." He said, "Well, what's the other bad news?" So well, the bad news is the brains are very expensive and they're not covered by insurance. So well, how expensive are they? So the first brain we have is the brain of a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist. 
that costs a million dollars. He says, million dollars, all right, we sell the house and the portfolio, and I think we can get the million bucks together. What about the other ones? He said, forget it, if that's a lot, forget it. No, I want to know, what are the other ones? He says, well, the, the next one is the brain of a Nobel Prize winning physicist, and that's $10 million. I said, my God, now that is expensive. He said, what's the last one? He said, I'll forget the last one. What is it? I need to know, what's the last one? The last one's the brain of an investment banker. <laughs> she said, well, how much is that? He said, $100 million. She thinks about it for a second, says, well, if a Pulitzer Prize winning novelist is a million dollars and a Nobel Prize winning physicist is $10 million, what could possibly be so valuable about the brain of an investment banker that it would be worth $100 million? He looks at it and says, never been used. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I said I was, I tried to resist it, I tried to resist, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, so, um, I always like to, when I'm speaking somewhere, and I have been traveling a lot, so look for things along the way that, that are just, let's say, recent indicators of something. So I actually had a couple of other props that I've been using on this trip, which was, um, one of them was an article from the International Herald Tribune from about 10 days ago. And the, the headline, I actually have it here, the, he the headline says, at the crossroads of finance and culture. There's a big, like, half-page article about the crossroads of finance and culture. What the hell is that about? I mean, have we ever been at a time when people are talking about the intersection of finance and culture? And, and the article is about moments in time when social and financial institutions seem to be breaking apart. It, talked, it actually had a picture of Jimmy Stewart and It's a Wonderful Life, if you, any of you know that movie, um, about the depression and bank failures and whatnot. Um, uh, and I al also, from the same trip, The Economist had a, a, um, something, a, a dialogue, and the, the, it, was, it was maybe 12 thought leaders, some of them very famous, debating the question, do free markets corrode moral character? This is The Economist, a big spread in the middle of The Economist. So we're at a moment in time because of what's going on where, let's say, systemic questions are being asked, and certainly the first time I can remember where you know major commentators are actually talking about the future of capitalism, and is this just a horrible adjustment, or is it really something much deeper than that? So um, in Cambridge uh, yesterday, before I got on the train to come down to New York, I stumbled on this book, maybe some of you know, it's called The Ascent of Money by Niall Ferguson, who's a, a very well-known, award-winning uh, kind of economic histor historian, but he does a lot about economics. So I'm just going to read a couple of sentences here, just this kind of speaks for itself. At times, the ascent of, by the way, I think it's really great, I'm reading somebody else's book. When my book just came out 10 days ago, that's the kind of person I know. I am going to read a little bit from mine, too. I'm going to read more from mine. I'm just going to do a little bit from him. All right. Uh, at times, the ascent of money has seemed inexorable. In 2006, the measured economic output of the entire world was around $47 trillion. The total market capitalization of the world's stock markets was $51 trillion. The total value of domestic and international bonds was $68 trillion. Mm. The amount of derivatives outstanding was, anybody want to guess? Quadrillion. Uh, what is a quadrillion? <laughs> Finally, someone a number that we can't even uh, think of. 473 trillion. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, I can keep reading, but I won't. A bunch more. And then, he, then here's the sentence. Planet finance is beginning to dwarf planet Earth. Really a great sentence. So, um, very timely given the subject that I'm going to talk to you about. Um, let's see, what else can I do before I run? So, why does this say Grafton, Vermont? I know we're not in Grafton, Vermont, although I have been traveling a lot lately, so I, you know, it could be one of those campaign stops where I talk to you for a half hour before I realize that I'm not in Grafton, Vermont. Um, but the reason, the reason I'm using this is um, I'm not going to do this whole PowerPoint. I'm just going to kind of flip through it. I'm going to do maybe half of it or two-thirds of it. Um, this is, uh, we're doing workshops. Uh, this was the first one. We're doing uh, several workshops around the country talking about how we would do slow money in a region. And we're doing the workshops with food company CEOs, farmers, investors, donors, NGO leaders. I think that's the basic stakeholder groups. Um, and, and again, the punchline in all this is, if you want to take the most specific thing we're trying to do, it's figure out how to galvanize the flow of capital in support of local food systems. Um, and, and again, I'm gonna, I'll give you more than you want on that topic, but um, again, if I, if, if I really kind of jump to the bottom in the interest of it's, it's the evening and, and I want to share a lot of information with you and hopefully have a discussion, but not necessarily drag you, oops, drag you through the whole thing. 
I would say the numbers are really, um, here are some other numbers. So these were some very bombastic, big global numbers. So other numbers. If I ask you things like, what percentage of U.S. philanthropy goes to sustainable agriculture? Donations. Or what percentage of the USDA budget goes to organ research in organics? Or what percentage of U.S. farmland is certified organic? Or any number of other things. What percentage of venture capital goes to organic food? Kind of a crude category, but still. All of those things? Anybody want to guess the range of percentages that would be answered to all of those? You just say less than 1%. It's, it's actually less than 0.5%. It's between 0.1 and 0.5%. So you can, you can sort of say to yourself, we might as well round to zero. You know, it's like we're not, all of our money is streaming towards industrial agriculture, which is a part of industrial finance and industrial capitalism. So um, even though I'm guessing many of you in the room know about slow food, think it's really cool, Go, maybe go to a CS, maybe participate in a CSA, go to farmer's markets. Um, so those of us who are kind of interested in, in, in biology and soil and agriculture and health and a lot of other things, sometimes think more is going on than is really going on. These things are experiencing growth. There's growth in CSAs, there's growth in farmer's markets, but we are not, so I, this is good. I'm doing this before I start because I'm good, because then I can blow through some of the slides and not linger on them. Um, here's another, here's another, let's say, trivia. Um, how many people here know what CSAs are? Is everyone here familiar with that? So the vast majority, community supported agriculture, meaning it's a farm in which um, usually neighbors, local c consumers, buy a share of the farm produce in advance of the farm season. So if there are 300 members of the CSA, each one buys one 300th of whatever the farm produces in advance. They give the farmer the money in advance, and then once a week you go to the farm and pick up your one 300th, whatever it is. Sometimes it's delivered. That's a nuance, but it's the same basic principle. Um, there are 2,000, I'll give you parts of the, the instead of uh, making it be a painful trivia quiz, I'll give, there are 2,000 CSAs in the United States, up uh, from nothing 20 years ago. There are 100,000 people who belong to CSAs in the United States. All right, so it's 100,000 divided by 2,000, right? So that's an average of 50 people per CSA. These are very small things on the average. What's the largest CSA in the world? It's in Denmark. Maybe you want to take a while, I guess there's no, no, no reason you would know this. 55,000 members in one CSA. It's a $55 million thing. So if you think about those is numbers, it is not government sponsored. Um, it's, uh, so let's not worry about the details of that CSA. I, the name will appear on there if I get back to one of those slides. But the point is, all of this cool stuff that has to happen to start rebuilding local economies and local food systems in this country has barely begun. I mean, it's, and there's no organized source of support for it, which is, you know, where we're trying to go. So if you can stick with me another second or two, I think before I go into the slides, and just to assert my dominance over this famous author, I'm going to read from my book. He's not here to defend himself. Um, so um, I hope many of you will get this book because it's really an invitation to an exploration and a, and a dialogue. Um, you're going to hear a lot of things here. We, we have a lot of questions. We have some answers, but we definitely have a direction. And um, let's say designing something that will be an antidote to globalization is not, in some ways, it's very simple. But in today's world, the simple has gotten complicated. Um, but I say that because I'm going to read you one page here from the book. And it's, this, this might sound very a uh, little bombastic, and perhaps it is. But I actually believe that um, while we are shooting at a target called local food systems, we're actually talking about the underpinnings of globalization, and we have to not be afraid to say that. Every 250 years or so, it seems, we arrive at a threshold moment in the history of capital and culture. In 1500, two men in Amsterdam stood on a bridge over a canal, designing the joint stock company minimizing risks to capital and galvanizing the flow of investment in exploration, conquest, and export. The outlines of the new world were as yet undefined and the notion of limits to growth unimaginable. In 1750, two men in New Amsterdam stood under a tree on, a, on the cow path that would become Wall Street, designing a stock exchange that would create hitherto unknown degrees of financial liquidity, and so galvanize the flow of capital in support of exploration, extraction, and manufacture. Corporations were small, continents were large, industrialization was incipient, the prudent man and the invisible hand about to enjoy their considerable time in the sun. And the notion that the resilience of natural systems had limits was about to suggest itself, that's Malthus, 
but only briefly and only to be swiftly discredited and debunked. In 2000, we are entering a period of urgent post-industrial, post-Malthusian reassessment and reconnoitering. We find ourselves on a new threshold, signals of systemic unsustainability proliferating alongside those of ever-accelerating capital markets and technological innovation. Consumerism and global markets are ascendant, carbon sinks are overloaded, and the, ideas, and the idea of limits to growth calls for radical reconsideration. It falls to us to undertake a new project of system design. That's a phrase you're going to see again. The creation of new forms of intermediation that catalyze the transition from a commerce of extraction and consumption to a commerce of preservation and restoration. It sounds pretty easy. We should be able to figure out how to do that. Um, and then, just dropping down from that grandiose rhetoric down to actually the ground, I'm going to read you some comments by uh, one of the founder owners of one of the largest CSAs in the country uh, called Full Belly Farm uh, outside uh, about 100 miles from San Francisco. Microbial life in the soil is our bank. If we extract life faster than we reinvest, the soil becomes finite, says Paul Muller, one of the owners of Full Belly Farm in Gwinda, California. Full Belly's CSA, more than 15 years old, delivers its shares, which cost $17 per week, to approximately 1,500 shareholders, mostly in the Bay Area. That makes them one of the top 10 CSAs in the country in, in scale. Our customers are, are also our bank, he continues. They are our storehouse, storehouse of financial capital. What is really important about CSAs is that these relationships allow us to leave behind the export model, which for years was all there was in farming. You grew food, but you went to the <coughs> excuse me, you went to the market to buy groceries. In fact, one of our neighbors has been raising cattle for 50 years, and until last year, he had never eaten any of his own beef. Just think about how profound that is. Maybe it doesn't seem profound to you, but it does to me. In the old export model, you, nev you never knew the buyer. You didn't realize the this is still Paul Muller. You didn't realize the full value of your produce, so you couldn't reinvest. With the CSA model, we are in a position to reinvest, to keep money moving locally, and this has a revitalizing effect on rural communities that desperately need it. More than that, the CSA creates direct feedback loops between consumers and the growing of their food. The value of these information-rich relationships is hard to overstate, he concludes. So we begin a crude taxonomy of the restorative economy and the local food systems that are critical to its health. Small farms, small food enterprises, a culture that values relationships and qualitative distinctions as much as it values transactions and metrics. Soil that is valued for its organic matter and biodiversity. Food that is valued for its freshness and absence of toxic residues. Communities that value making a living over making a killing. Investors who value a carrot in the hand as much as two futures contracts in the bush. I'm supposed to chuckle a little bit at that. <laughs> if, I'm, not, I'm not afraid to give you the cues when you need them. <laughs> if family farmers are the microorganisms in the soil of the restorative economy, then local entrepreneurs are its earthworms. We don't quite know what to make of either of them in purely financial terms. Just as we don't yet understand much about what Mas Masamoto called the synergisms of the farm. He wrote a book called Epitaph for a Peach. I'm just curious, anybody here know about it? Beautiful book about um, multi-generational um, farming in California. But we know how important they are to the cultural and ecological web. Just as a farmer who knows his land can tell so much, though the science be yet in its infancy, from the feel, the smell, and the taste of the soil. It just may be that all the financial metrics and taxonomic sophistication in the world will not compete for meaning and for direction with the feel, the smell, and the taste of the soil. It is not easy to say such a thing with a straight face in this day of professional disciplines and computational firepower. We find ourselves in the position of having to fight our way back through veils of urbanization and industrialization and securitization and institutionalization to the most basic of insights, the most basic of affirmations. Okay, no more reading. <laughs>